Good afternoon, and very pleased to be moderating this uh, panel today on behalf of De Groef Peter Kem Bank. My name is Adelaide Krakow, and I head the Climate and Environmental Impact Investment Activities within the European Investment Fund. For this webinar, I'll be joined by Bruno Colman, Group CEO of De Groef Peter Kem, Daniel van Moltke, Managing Partner at Quadia Impact Finance, and Chris Gorel Barnes, marine conservationist and co-founder of Ocean 14 Capital. For those of you that may not be familiar with the European Investment Fund, we are a European public institution, part of the European Investment Bank Group. Our central mission is to provide access to financing to European companies and ventures. We do so by partnering with financial intermediaries such as venture capital and private equity funds that have the necessary proximity to market to identify innovative and high growth companies and support them not only with capital, but also value add expertise. To date and over the last 25 years, we've invested about 21 billion euros in over 850 venture capital and private equity funds across Europe that are active in different sectors and stages of company development. Through our investment activities, we've become the largest provider of equity risk financing in Europe helping to finance innovation and further the growth of the European economy. But from our standpoint as investors, generating economic growth and value is no longer enough. Over the last decade, repeat financial crisis, the climate environmental emergency, and a global pandemic have raised fundamental questions on how we live and how our economy and financial markets support, or on the contrary, harm our society and planet. An important question at the forefront of this debate is how an investment's benefit or cost to society can be integrated into investment decision processes and how it can become a fundamental transparent measure of performance alongside financial returns and serve as a selection criteria for investors. In response, new investment strategies have emerged that look beyond pure financial returns. These investment approaches have many names as well as very different meanings, ranging from investment activities incorporating ESG standards to socially responsible investing, and finally impact investing, which is the most advanced attempt to combine financial return objectives with an investment's contribution to the sustainable development of society and the economy. What is considered as invest, uh, impact investing is thus broad, and there's a large range of potential strategies and options between the two extremes of finance first, which would be traditional investing, and impact first, which would be the equivalent of philanthropy. True impact investing is an investment approach that seeks not only to generate profits, but also have a positive and measurable impact on society by investing in businesses that at their core are striving to resolve fundamental climate, environmental, and social problems. EIF is a long-standing and committed investor to the impact space, with our first investment to a climate tech fund dating back to the early 2000s. Our impact investment activity will ramp up significantly over the next years in order to serve the climate, environmental, and social objectives targeted by the European Union under the Green Deal and the InvestEU programs. To fulfill Europe's climate environmental goals and reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 55% by the year 2030, it's estimated that we'll need to invest at least 500 billion euros more each year versus what we're doing now. 
When we look at a global level, the equivalent funding gap is of 2.5 trillion euros per year. It's obvious that the transformation that is needing, uh, needed is far-ranging and deep. And this next decade is not only critical in terms of making advances, but actually existential. Public intervention alone can only go so far and is vastly insufficient in relation to the capital and efforts that are required to tackle the pressing challenges that we're facing today. Thankfully, there's a growing awareness that sustainability is key to ensuring our future. The impact investment market reached roughly 700 billion euros last year and is steadily rising. Individual investors, family offices, and foundations that have pioneered positive social change and impact through their historic support of social causes are ideally positioned to lead this new emerging asset class. One sector that is particularly vulnerable and that is focusing increased public attention and investment is the agri-food industry. The agri-food industry represents about 7 trillion euros in val value, is responsible for feeding the planet, and employs over 40% of the global workforce. Global food demand is moreover expected to increase by 60% in the next 30 years, based on the expected growth of the world population. Food security, however, is threatened by climate change, biodiversity loss, and environmental degradation, a risk that is only magnified by population growth. As Franz Timmermans stated just a few days ago, Vice President of the European Commission, if we don't fix this, our children will be waging wars over water and food. Our distinguished panelists will help us to shed light on the issues undermining the sustainability and viability of the, our food system, both on land and below water. They will also share insights on how we can address current challenges and the important role that private investors can play in affecting the systemic changes required through impact investing. Without further ado, I would kindly ask that each of our panelists present themselves, starting with Bruno, uh, then Daniel and Chris. Hello, this is uh, Bruno. Um, I'm very honored to be with you. Just two words of introduction. By education, I'm a PhD in applied economics, and I'm currently the CEO of Bank de Cour of Peter Kam, who is associated to this very nice event. Um, hi, I'm uh, thankful for the invitation. My name is Daniel von Moltke. I'm managing partner at Quadia. Quadia, uh, based in Geneva, is a uh, pioneer investing uh, space, and we finance uh, innovative uh, companies which strengthen the transition towards a regenerative economy. Uh, with the with the aim to reduce the ecological footprint uh, of our activities and respect the planetary boundaries that impose themselves, as Adelaide has just uh, laid out, um, we define a regenerative economy to be a system that favors local, collaborative, functional, that means qualitative, circular, and bio-inspired elements, and that promotes fairness uh, in the in the supply chain and respects the natural resources of our planet. And that's um, how we've um, aligned our investment strategy, which is essentially to provide growth capital to, uh, to post-revenue SMEs that are pr providing with their product and service a solution and that can be transformative in their sector. And uh, in the context of our strategic impact investing partnership with the Bank de uh, Gouffetacam, we're managing now a closed-end fund, the Regenero Impact Fund, um, some of which um, some of our listeners may be investors. Um, and we recently held our final closing at um, a euro of 52 million. And over the past year, this fund has already deployed approximately 25 million euros in 13 companies um, and realized one exit. Chris, over to you. Yeah, thanks, Adelaide. Um, Thanks um, for, for putting on this very important panel. Um, thank you for the um, introduction, Adelaide. Um, I concur with everything you said, um, what is needed to be done and the, the, the emergency we have in the next 10 years. Um, I'm a, an oceanpreneur, so I'm an entrepreneur in the ocean space. I've been a, a marine conservationist now for um, over 12 years. My journey started making a movie um, before Sea Spiracy hit, hit Netflix. Um, which explained the devastating effects we are inflicting on the ocean through overfishing. 
I then co-founded the Blue Marine Foundation, which um, 11 years on is the largest and the most impactful marine NGO in Europe, Middle East and Africa. We've helped fund and protect over 5 million square miles of ocean. You can see those marine reserves from space. We've developed uh, innovations in sustainable fisheries management all over the world. And we have about 50 projects uh, in, the, in countries from the Maldives, in Turkey, in the Indian Ocean, the Atlantic Ocean, um, all over the world. Um, it's a fantastic foundation, but uh, philanthropy has its limits um, and the problem with the ocean is so vast. So I decided that we needed to create a vehicle that could attract the necessary institutional capital to try and solve the problem with the ocean. Uh, I do believe that the deeper the problem, the bigger the opportunity and the problem in the ocean is very vast. So two years ago, we launched an impact fund, Ocean 14 Capital, of which I am one of the founding partners. 14 for SDG 14, we're a growth equity impact fund focusing on trying to solve the challenge of United Nations Sustainable Goal 14, investing in trying to restore uh, and help protect the ocean through investing in food security and marine ecosystems. Um, we are a 150 million euro fund. We have a significant commitment from the European Investment Fund, and we'll be doing our first close um, in uh, of just after the summer. Uh, and I'm very pleased to be here. So thank you for having me. Great. Great. Thanks very much for your introductions, which really helped to set the stage for our discussion. Looking to you now, Bruno, uh, public policy and investment has demonstrated to be insufficient to address the climate, environmental and social challenges faced by our economy and society. What role do you think that private investors and in particular family offices and high net worth individuals can play in affecting change and contributing to a more sustainable economy? And what advantages would you say they have versus other types of private investors as regards impact investing? I would like to take a broader perspective and maybe focus on the Eurozone uh, with regard to public investment. Uh, as you know, the, the Euro got introduced some 20 years ago, and one of the ideas of this currency was that uh, the, the, the welfare state should be uh, decreased, uh, that uh, public debt should decrease, that budget deficit should decrease, and this was totally incompatible with the aging population because the aging population requires you know, additional social expenditures. So what happened is that in order to meet the so-called Euro criteria, uh, public investment decreased because there was no slack uh, for governments to, to invest. That, that's one thing. Uh, the second thing is that today there is uh, definitely a, a public awareness of all the challenges ahead and um, the, the strong belief that uh, debt cannot be delegated only to the public sector because of others of the constraints I, I just mentioned. So that there will be so, some kind of joint initiatives between the, the private and the public sector. And what is changing within companies is that their public responsibility is increasing. You know, um, when uh, we entered into the so-called neoliberalism some uh, 40 years ago, uh, we adopted the, the principles of the Chicago School. By the way, uh, this is the, in the 80s that I got my MBA from an American university. And at that time, it was postulated that the business of business was to make business. Today, companies have a broader responsibility. Uh, they need to interact with all the stakeholders. Uh, and it means that the social purpose of companies uh, is definitely recognized. What we feel today, what we see today uh, at the bank, the Grove Peter Kam, and we are managing money for wealthy families, is that they want uh, the money to be invested uh, in, uh, with, with social or environmental or climate impact, which means that they do want to make sure that the, the money is well channeled uh, through the, these goals. And that is very important because this level of awareness at the level of investors will definitely have a, a fallback effect on all the, the future forms of investment in the future. So, so to answer your question, there is a, a new awareness, a new, uh, and I, I use that word on purpose, you know, so, socio-political mood that is emerging. And to me, uh, this crisis, uh, this pandemic uh, we, we are still in today, uh, definitely triggered the, this new level of awareness. 
Indeed, Bruno, I think that uh, public conscience is growing. Chris, Daniel, would you have any comments um, to the questions? I, I, I agree 100%. I think that the, I think the pandemic has, has made a, a, a lot of people very acutely aware of the fragility of the earth and you know, how easy it is for things that are normal to be destroyed. And it's certainly shone a bright light on the, a bright light on the need to focus protection on biodiversity. You, know, you can very much link the pandemic to the fact that you know, we have destroyed biodiversity and that's why we've entered territories of the world where some of the diseases that are causing destruction um, have been found. So I think it's given a, a, a certainly a new understanding of why biodiversity protection is so important, but that has led to people more focused on concerned about the climate crisis and how the pandemic is it just going to be a mild shot across the bow to the unfolding um, challenges that we're going to face from the climate crisis so that we now need to address this with urgent, urgent action. And I think it's very encouraging that new money, uh, both family offices and institutional investors now are really looking at how they can use their capital to help solve some of these challenges. Uh, I, I would concur. I think there's a huge opportunity actually for private uh, capital to finance the transition and if we think about what's required, it is also innovation in society, which is brought by businesses. Uh, there's growth capital, which may uh, need to take on some risks and have a longer term horizon. Um, if we think about impact investing largely in alternative investments, they are public, uh, private investments and, and perhaps uh, less liquid. And so um, the, the, the capital that, that um, that's needed can be provided by, by, the, by the public hand, but also really by the private sector. And there, there's an advantage to those that can take on some liquidity risk. Uh, mm. And I think there is perhaps um, uh, an idea that there is an inverse relationship between the, the extent of impact and the, the liquidity of, of investment. So um, mm. the capital that's put to work for real innovation and change um, can, can garner um, um, Decent, decent risk-adjusted returns uh, in in our in our society today. Very good. Yeah. We'll be speaking to the combination of impact and financial returns uh, a little later. One topic that's um, attracting particular attention from impact investors is food security. So agriculture has made impressive progress over the last decades in terms of increasing production output and food availability through industrial means and processes. This, however, has also come at a huge environmental and social cost. And as it stands today, the access to food is still quite unequal. And as we mentioned earlier, you know, uh, food demand is really set to increase and uh, the current uh, state of the industry won't be able to respond. Daniel, what do you think are the major threats as regards global food security and uh, what would be necessary for a sustainable food system? That's a big question. You've alluded to some of the threats and challenges in your introduction. I think it's undeniable that agricultural practices uh, have made uh, strong advances, um, but also that the industrial food system as it operates today, it, it's really also a source of a number of major sustainability challenges. And, and in order to feed uh, 10 billion uh, people on Earth by 2050, we, we certainly will need to continue to transform the system massively, uh, which is putting a pressure on, on our planetary boundaries. We can think of greenhouse gas emissions, soil quality, biodiversity loss, as you've mentioned, the, the water issue. Um, just a few numbers, industrial agricultural, uh, which has a significant energy intensity, contributes approximately 13% of the world's total greenhouse gas emissions, and that's the second largest source of emissions by sector. One topic which is a particular um, attention for us in our investment activities is food waste, and one third of the food produced in the world for human consumption actually gets lost or wasted, um, and this amounts to a, a value equ equivalent of 680 billion dollars in industrial countries and 310 billion dollars in developing countries so we're at a trillion um, lost value 
And when we waste food, we also waste all the energy and the water that it took to grow this, to harvest it, to, to process it, to transport it, to package it. Um, what's more, if it lands in landfill, uh, it generates methane, which is a, a strong GHG uh, gas that's, um, that's uh, more detrimental than carbon dioxide. So um, World Wildlife Fund estimates that uh, six to eight percent of all human caused greenhouse gas emissions could be reduced if we stop wasting food. Um, a, a major driver uh, of biodiversity loss is obviously also uh, habitat loss to make way for agricultural production. Um, the, the, the Amazon uh, under threat uh, to make way for agricultural land through slash and burn is just an example that is very vivid perhaps in, in many people's minds because we've seen the images. Um, and, and, and then the oceans are under threat and, and Chris will be speaking more to that. So in, in the context of, of urbanization trends, food security um, and access to high quality fresh food is becoming a major issue. Um, and we see that in the pandemic, this is an issue just as valid in developed countries, Europe, uh, with vulnerable citizens lining up at food banks in record numbers in some of our cities as it is in developing countries where um, the plight of subsistence farmers and fisheries uh, that, are, um, that are fishing for their livelihood are under significant threat, not, not in the least due to change, climate change and a adaptation requirements to climate change. So how do we address these challenges? Um, it must be a sustainable food system. And um, for us, uh, that must favor the development of local uh, food systems um, backed by, for instance, uh, certification schemes um, that support consumers in their food uh, purchasing decisions. Um, and we at Quadia, through the regenerative uh, economy lens and through our uh, joint fund with Dubuque-Petacam, we've been investing in SMEs that are positioned in this space. Um, we, can, we, can, um, we can name, for instance, biodynamic production in, in, in apples, pears, and fruits in France. Um, um, or, or a local organic ice cream maker in, in, in Italy that is sourcing high quality mountainous milk uh, and, a, and an innovative um, player that is uh, reforming the, um, the office canteen sector with a focus on quality, quality and nutritious uh, meals for workers that have been uh, at home office the last year for sure, but that will be returning also back to their offices in the next few months. Mm -hmm. um, so, innovative companies are, challenge, are tackling these challenges and they're, they're bringing um, the production closer to home uh, and finding uh, scalable solutions that address also food waste. Mm -hmm. In the U.S., there is a growing market for um, taking food that would otherwise go wasted from farms and from distribution centers and getting it uh, to, 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 to consumers through innovative uh, distribution schemes. Um, and again, we've been investing in those types of players. Um, uh, Hungry Harvest uh, is one of those uh, as an example. Um, so we, we believe that um, really uh, these approaches will increase the resilience of food systems across the entire value chain. It will help shift consumers towards more local, healthier and high quality food. And that can help address um, the, and support the reduction of, of greenhouse gas emissions help strengthen communities and promote fair uh, business practices. It's also an employment generation. And I would add that all of these trends are in line with political priorities post-pandemic, if we think about the European uh, Green Deal, or also the uh, in the U.S., the Biden administration's strong push to favor renewable energy sources. Um, so uh, the positioning uh, is is should be good for the planet, but it's also um, generating interesting returns for the investors that have um, that have entrusted us with their capital. Thanks, Daniel. I think uh, many of us weren't aware of the issues, you know, related to food waste, and obviously um, we're all actually, you know, quite vulnerable to all the problems related to food security. If we look now to the ocean. The global blue economy is expa expected to expand at twice the rate of the mainstream economy by 2030. Marine ecosystems are at the center of many of the world's essential needs and challenges from transportation and energy to climate and 
emission absorption. Oceans are also at the heart of global food security. Chris, what are, in your view, the biggest challenges facing the blue economy food industry today? Thanks very much um, for that question. I think that the, 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 biggest, the biggest challenge facing the planet is ensuring that we have a healthy ocean and a healthy marine ecosystem. So the number one thing we need to do, in my opinion, to ensure uh, we, 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 are, we are capable of living on this planet is to make sure that the ocean can perform its core function, which is regulating the planetary system. It's producing half the oxygen we breathe. It's absorbing half the carbon. Uh, that we produce and it's also feeding, you know, a billion of the poorest people on the planet and supplying food for three billion people. So the number one thing we have to do is to is to ensure the health. And that means that we need to enable it to produce and in able to do that, we must protect it. The ocean has an incredible propensity to recover if we managed its resources carefully. So we need to look at the ocean not just as something that is supplying food to us, but is actually something that is providing so much more. So number one, we need to make sure that the ocean can, can function, which means that it needs to have at least 30% of the ocean is protected, and then 70% of the ocean is sustainably managed. At the moment, the ocean is being completely depleted of its fish stocks, it's being dredged, and it's being... Uh, uh, really um, abused. So we've got to protect it, and then it is capable of providing food. And if I break its what it can provide into sort of three areas, so we've got aquaculture, fisheries, and then you know new aquaculture, which is algae, seaweed, and fauna and flora. With fisheries, we've got to drive much better regulations. Governments have got to be much better at regulating the fisheries. We've got to get rid of the insane subsidies. We've got about 27 billion of subsidies that are going often towards illegal, unregulated and unreported fishing that is causing issues. So we have to deal with that. We then have to make sure that we've really got proper transparency. We've got traceability. We've got proper data to know where these fish are coming from, how they've been fished, how they've been sold. Uh, and then even looking at the human rights issues so that we can manage the sustainable fisheries. With aquaculture, it's about 10 years behind, you know, on land agricultural innovation. We've got to invest heavily in innovation, in consolidation, in really trying to improve the way that uh, aquaculture works. You know, at the moment, there's a real issue with fish in, fish out. So to produce a kilogram of farmed fish, you're using about three kilograms of wild fish. So there's a real simple step change we can do there with funding alternatives to fish protein. And then lastly, the, the other sort of key food source, which is growing that the ocean provides is seaweed and algae. You know, there's a lot of evidence now that the, 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 the benefits that humans get from eating fish, whether that's the omega or the fatty acids, they're coming because the fish are eating the algae. So why don't we allow humans to eat the algae as well? So investing in algae production, investing in seaweed production, making that much more efficient through technologies and innovations to enable those industries to grow. And when those, those industries grow, the seaweed, the kelp, the algae, they in turn improve the health of the ocean. So all of those need to be connected and we need to drive the investment, the collaboration, and the regulation and if we have a healthy ocean we then have the ability to provide foods for billions of people bruno and daniel would you like to add anything to what chris has just said yes i would like to add something um, the first point i would like to mention is that um, unfortunately uh, when we have financial crisis it leads to a combination of crises uh, and so uh, the pandemic is one thing, the market went down, uh, they rebounded, but we see that uh, the markets are fragile. And it makes me think that in the 30s, during the, the big depression, by the way, my grandmother was American, she told me it happened, you know, there was starvation in the US. So sometimes we have a combination of crisis and we are talking food, you know, water shortages. The second point, uh, and it's a, a global statement, that goes beyond what was just mentioned is that finance is about discounting future cash flows. 
So one of the assumptions is that there is an infinity of cash flows coming in the future that you can discount back to today. Uh, this is true for conceptual uh, 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 I would say items, but if you talk about water and food, uh, you cannot make the assumption that the resources are infinite. And the same is true, by, I, I guess, for oceans, which means that at some point in time, the cost of what people call in economics uh, the externalities has, have to be factored in, and they haven't been factored in because, strangely enough, markets are sometimes blind. They do not see uh, uh, this happening. And so it means that it's one day there will be a market price adjustment to take into consideration what has just been mentioned. Please, there is some, somebody behind you. Somebody open the door. I, ho I, ho I hope you are not being robbed by somebody. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Thanks, Bruno. I think actually the comments you just made are very relevant to the issues that Chris highlighted in relation to the blue economy. Maybe moving mm. again to land, the detrimental impact of livestock farming and meat consumption has been well documented and is re receiving actually a lot of attention from media and, and general society. The replacement of animal-based protein uh, with plant-based or more environmentally friendly alternatives is an area that uh, is seeing a lot of innovation too, and increased VC and PE investment. Daniel, can you give us examples of how you or your companies uh, that you support are tackling uh, alternative proteins? Uh, yes, I can, uh, and I, I agree that the increased awareness of consumers are leading to dietary shifts towards alternative protein sources, healthier functional food, and, and higher nutritional quality. And that's translating to flexitarian and vegetarian diets, and we should not underestimate that trend. Uh, it is driven largely by young people, and my 20-year-old son is challenging me to no longer eat meat because he has adopted that as a matter of principle. And uh, we see that um, uh, the age group of 20 to 35 is three times more likely to adopt a vegetarian diet than us older uh, generations. Um, it, it's, it's clear that uh, uh, consumer awareness is, is trending in this direction, uh, thankfully so, and it, is, um, uh, and it is undermining a trend that is making uh, the vegan space a, a multi-billion dollar space. And um, we've seen strong growth and also PE transactions um, it, with corporates uh, buying um, growth companies. We can talk about the vegetarian butcher in the Netherlands bought by Unilever a couple years ago or a US-based Beyond Meat that uh, went uh, through a successful IPO. So it is already clear that this is a, a um, At Quadia, we've identified this fairly early partnering with a, a, a colleagues to uh, put together a portfolio of VC companies um, over the last three years where we've actually invested in 20 companies that are only um, uh, producing vegan products. Um, I, can, I can mention, for instance, BioGroup, that's a, a French provider of highly nutri nutritious fermented kombucha, which is joining the vegetarian with the nutritious trend uh, and has also developed a line of, of non-dairy vegan desserts. Or an, another um, um, growth company called Bendy, which is in France, selling ready-to-cook, ready-to-eat meals based on cereals, uh, so vegetarian and high-quality, um, high-quality um, uh, spices. Um, so uh, these companies are translating their commitment towards uh, uh, more flexitarian and vegetarian diets, one for one. At Quadia, we also look at supporting a shift from beef and pork production to more poultry and fish alternatives. So that doesn't go all the way to the vegetarianism, um, but they clearly have superior feed conversion ratios, which measure the efficiency at which livestock convert animal feed to the protein sources that humans then consume. And it, it, we can, we probably, it's very well known and documented the high water and energy intensity of the beef industry, uh, but cattle are, are um, requiring eight times more um, protein input to produce one unit of protein for the final consumption. The pork um, or pigs will be at four times. A chicken are already at two times, so that's a, that's a significant um, efficiency com compared to the, the beef diet. 
And uh, salmon, as an example of the fish industry, which Chris knows uh, so well, is at 1.3 times. So um, we, we need to shift away from those um, inefficient protein sources. Um, one further example, uh, we've invested in French-based insect with a Y, which is one of the leading in, um, um, leading companies that's producing insect-based feed, feed uh, st uh, stock at, at a much more efficient rate and that is going, for instance, into the aquaculture sector, because fish, some fish are, mm. are naturally eating insects in their habitat anyway. So there are already, um, that's, that's perhaps my, my, my motto, there are, uh, it's a growth, it's a growth uh, market and there are many opportunities and innovative companies that are addressing this. Regulation mm. and consumer trends are supporting this. Mm. Thanks, Daniel. Well, actually, building on this idea of a need to shift our diets, uh, a documentary recently aired by Netflix, uh, Sisperacy, seems to imply that sustainable fishing isn't possible and that as a consequence, we should stop eating seafood altogether. Chris, um, how would you refute this and what do you think can be done to make the fishing and aquaculture industry environmentally viable and sustainable for the long term? This is this is this is when uh, uh, digital conferences are annoying because I can't ask the audience to put their hand up and tell me how many of them have watched the documentary. But um, Seaspiracy seems to have been watched by everybody I know, um, and it's a question that we're we're often asked. So let me just quickly um, mention the film before I go into to to to, to my thoughts about uh, what what is sustainable and and what what can be done. But. The film, I, 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 I'm pleased and we are pleased that it's been made because it has done a great job of shining the light on the terrible industrial practices that are happening at sea from commercial fishing and the destruction that these vessels are causing both to the biodiversity, to the ocean, but also, you know, human, uh, human abuse on board. So that's great. The film, though, fails to actually have correct data on uh, fisheries data on sustainable fisheries and sustainable aquaculture and I think that and and this is sort of linking back to what um, what Daniel said about the drive to veganism you know it's all very well and good a film to tell you know a white prim primarily primary white Netflix audience to go and be vegan that's not a solution for you know half of the world who are struggling to feed themselves and actually need fish as their main source of protein so yes absolutely we all need to eat more plant-based food but that's very easy for us to say in our um in our nice nice houses in 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 the west so are there alternatives is there sustainable aquaculture is there sustainable fisheries absolutely yes and you know from a from a conservation perspective, there are sustainable fisheries. The, the Blue Marine Foundation has been driving this. We have examples all over the world, particularly great ones in the UK, where we help the fishermen um, think about protecting the area and, and we help them improve their yield and actually improve their margins by catching less fish and actually making more money. And this, this, this is happening all over the world. And small scale fishermen really can create great sustainable fisheries it's the it's the really destructive industrial fishing that does the most damage so absolutely sustainable fishing is important and at ocean 14 capital that's one of our key investment theses and we're looking into how do we use data on vessels to uh, really record and track using artificial intelligence to, 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 to track the fisheries, to be able to understand more what, what the potential of bycatch is, what the fishery is able of catching, and then using technologies like blockchain to really be able to trace the fish so that actually you can have fisheries that are better managed, they're more efficient, um, they're catching less of the bad stuff, and uh, and they are sustainable. Similarly, with aquaculture, you can absolutely have sustainable aquaculture. And uh, and Daniel raised raised the very important point of, you know, one of the biggest issues with aquaculture is is fish feed ratio. So the fact that you need wild fish to uh, create farmed fish. And there's many many innovations that we're l looking to invest in in that space. Insects is a key area. How do we how do we grow and scale insects as a, as an alternative to fish protein? And you know there are alternatives with with seaweed. There's technologies that can be used to grow fish on land. So RAS based systems we're looking at investing in where 
the fish are grown in in containers on land where there's no escapees which is a big problem there's much less need for antibiotics uh, 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 and um, there's no um, there's no runoff so there's none of the, the, the fishes um, poo that comes in and damages so much of the ecosystem and then there's um, interest in sustainable aquaculture in pond so where the fish are in a much more natural habitat they're eating uh, algae the pond is cleaned by tidal runoff and so they're not in cages and escaping so there's there's a huge amount of innovation in aquaculture to have sustainable aquaculture. There's a lot of emphasis on trying to get sustainable fisheries. We need regulation from governments. We need much more control over the fisheries. We need much better collaboration and data and traceability. Um, and then absolutely we can, we, we, we can drive, we can invest in um, sustainable aquaculture and sustainable fisheries and they can be a very important um, uh, element of the, the of, of food security uh, i'd like to uh, just make two points here to add i i, I the oceans are a commons uh, problem uh the tragedy of the commons and so they do need uh, uh government action and collaboration internationally otherwise businesses will not be able to bring the solutions um, and secondly, I think on land and, and with the, these solutions that Chris is mentioning, we should be aware of what's the right scale. Our globalized economy has led towards centralization and ever greater scale. And that has in, in brought a huge efficiencies, of course. But uh, it, the bottom up economy that is more locally based, that is respective of the, of, of the carrying capacity of, of regional ecosystems, uh, will need to um, adapt and promote the right kind of scale, and that includes also smaller units, smaller companies that uh, that are are operating within the limits and within their boundaries. Indeed, Daniel. You've all given actually a lot of examples of innovation geared towards impact and that can really help change our food system. This is a question for all of you, maybe starting with Bruno. Do you think that impact entrepreneurship or the impact revolution is likely to become the tech revolution of the 2020s? Do you think that integrating risks, this triple helix of risk, return, impact, can have a transformative effect on our global economy? Um, yes, I believe uh, this will happen. Uh, my, my humble perception, uh, I would say intuition, is that we are at the start of a, a real new industrial revolution. Uh, we had one uh, that was called the Neolithic, when people started to understand agriculture. We had one in the 19th century, or a little bit before. Uh, and then we had sub-industrial uh, uh, revolutions, like uh, the one that took place with the uh, internet and even the digitalization. Today, we are at the start of something bigger and I've troubled by the way figuring out you know what will be the level of progress and innovation in the future but I think that we will understand that the concept the morphology of investing is going to change and by that I mean that in a world where interconnection is the name of the game you cannot put fences and borders between companies governments clients, suppliers, nature, you know, all these things. They, we, 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 we have understood that the, the, the interaction was the model we would be in in the future. And that means that uh, impact investment, investment, investing will definitely be the way that we and the future generation will we, we look at money and at investment. Uh, and this, this is critical because um, even if you take a dive into economic theories, it was all about labor versus capital, uh, left against right. It was all, all the time based on the opposition of production factors. Today we have one production factor that was, uh, that seemed to be unlimited, that is nature. And this third production factor will supersede the position uh, between the two old ones, that is labor and capital. So it's a, a new morphology of capitalism that is emerging. And if some people today have the impression that they have to give up some private benefits for future collective prosperity, they are wrong, 
because there is no such thing as private benefits in a world where scarcity of resources will be painful to all of us. So definitely it's a new morphology. Uh, uh, and I think we can, to some extent, you know, uh, uh, forget about you know, the Marxist theories. We are in something different. The triple helix, as you mentioned, yes. Mm. Very, very true, Bruno. Uh, Chris, uh, Daniel, would you like to add anything? Um, uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, I, mean I, I, I concur. I think we are, you know, as I think Ronald Cohen put it, we are, we are at that point of, of an impact revolution. And, you know, we don't really, we don't have a choice. We've got to do something. There's an emergency. We've all got a, you know, a, a goal of trying to score the United Nations Sustainable De Development Goals by 2030. And we're not doing very well in terms of achieving them. So we need to attract the capital into this space in order to do what's necessary to, you know, protect and restore the planet to health. And the best way of doing that is going to be impact investing. In order for it to really scale, we need to attract the institutional capital. And to do that, we need to have better uh, reporting and measurement systems. You know, if you can't, you know, can't measure it, you can't, can't manage it. So we need a lot more focus on how we are going to measure the success of impact. We've, we've got a framework at Ocean 14 Capital. I think it's quite unique for the ocean space. And we hope to drive a lot of uh, a lot of change within the blue economy, almost be the wave that is how you would report on what does a sustainable and regenerative blue economy investment look like. But we need that across all of the environmental um, areas of investing so that people can really, investors can really measure and manage what their investment is. There's a financial return and an impact return and they need to be, they need to be equally weighted. Mm -hmm. I would agree uh, that uh, that uh, the challenge for impact investing is to measure, uh, to audit, uh, and to prove that the positive impact uh, is being generated. Otherwise, um, it, it won't be able to grow. Uh, and standards will be converging, although there is a multiple no, multi approaches. And that also reflects the bottom-up local economy developments that I mentioned earlier. I, I think it's... Um, it's interesting to note that uh, the impact investing is coming of age at a time when there's also more transparency. And that's obviously based on the IT re revolution. So the, the value chains are being uh, made transparent. They're visible to the consumer, uh, to the supplier, to the actors in the supply chain and to the to the investors as well. And that's that is, I think, the, the backdrop of of this sector growing further at at Quadia. We certainly don't believe this is only a trend like the tech trend that was a bubble no it, it it it's it must be the retooling of our financial system um, mm -hmm. and investment platforms to integrate this imperative of sustainability and planetary bound boundaries into the the way capital is allocated and the mm -hmm. way we we work and measure success um, mm -hmm. coming out of the pandemic uh, um I, I think there's a silver lining uh, because we're seeing some of these trends uh, and the and the consciousness accelerating yeah. Uh, and uh, we see investment priorities, uh, political ones, uh, also the EIF, but also the European Union, Union as I mentioned, the EU Green uh, Deal, um, address uh, these issues um, that are already yeah. highlighted mm. through the SDGs. Uh, and um, it is true that the regulatory regimes is tightening. You can think of plastics, packaging, circularity and textiles. Uh, in, 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 in tire recycling and consumer electronics, the regulatory trend has been picked up and is tightening and it goes hand in hand with the consumer awareness that is uh, increasing picking up these solutions and caring about what, what uh, is being produced and how it's being produced. So mm. for, for, for us at Quadia, this is not a short term trend. It is a true uh, paradigm shift. And there I would concur with Bruno's assessment. Yeah, and you, you you'd agree, Daniel, that we need to have much more sophisticated reporting because there's a lot of uh, financial funds sort of reverse engineering ESG into an existing infrastructure, and there's a lot of you know green and blue washing that actually we really need to focus on a, a better standardization of reporting what does positive environmental or social impact look like and how is that going to be measured measured and indeed how is that actually going to be to drive 
performance. You know, and one of the things we've done at Ocean 14 is we're tying, you know, a significant amount of our carry of our performance fee to our impact KPIs to really put our money where our mouth is. And it's, you know, and it's something that I'd like to be on, you know, to get that to 100 percent. So you really are, you know, impact impact led in terms of your uh, your performance fee as a fund manager. Thanks. No, we're unfortunately coming to the end of our discussion. Maybe uh, to finish, Bruno, for families who are interested in using impact investing to build their family legacy, where do you think they should start and uh, what should they be mindful of? Well, I would say that uh, we have first to start with our own uh, personal behavior. And uh, for me, it starts with uh, raising uh, my, my daughter the right way, the proper way with regard to all the constraints we have uh, uh, discussed today. Uh, with regard to impact investing, you know, I can only give the example of the Grove Peter Cam. We are uh, heavily involved into uh, private equity, and uh, we have uh, more and more requests from clients asking us to design their portfolio according to impact investing, investment. So I think that, uh, you know, if somebody wants to make a difference uh, while investing and putting capital at risk, it's all about redesigning a portfolio that would be uh, uh, in line with what we have just discussed. This is it. Simple as that. Great. Well, thank you all. Uh, we have a few minutes left and are ready to open the floor for questions from the audience. I'm looking here at the Q&A. Um, the first question we have is, what do you see as the biggest forces of resistance, progress, blocking and progressing your agenda? Big companies flooding the global market with cheap food, politicians chasing after easy votes, a growing gap between the richest and poorest. How do we bring them all on board? But you, you know, I, I, if, if, I, if, I, if I may answer, uh, there could be social opposition, uh, and that's a trick. Uh, we saw that happening in France uh, two years ago with uh, the yellow uh, vests or jackets, whatever you name them. Uh, with people uh, opposing, being opposed. There was a request for more uh, ecological awareness. In time, people were rioting because uh, they had to pay taxes. And, and, and so uh, finding the synthesis between these constraints will be extremely difficult for governments. They will have maybe to deal with social unrest, and we see, we see that happening everywhere. Uh, and at the same time, uh, refraining themselves from being populist and uh, putting a vision regarding you know, all the, the challenges we have discussed. That, that will be extremely tricky. Uh, and, and that's why uh, the government has a role to play. We cannot delegate only uh, the, these issues regarding water, food, nature to markets. Uh, we need some counterpower. And this country would be governments in order to make sure that there will be a balanced approach between the reality of capitalism, of hard naked uh, uh, capitalism, and at the same time, uh, so, so, social uh, social vision. Very good. Can I just answer or add? I think this is a great question. Um, uh, and I would actually answer it on economics. I've been all my career, all my 30 year uh, professional life. Um, in the environmental movement and environmental policy. Um, and I think what is really hindering us is that we still haven't internalized correctly the prices of the extra number. And uh, we need to not black blacklist uh, corporations that are running through public markets and listed stock exchanges. But we need to be aware that the prices that are formed there and the decisions, the business decisions that are made through these companies, including then institutional investors, pension fund managers, their consultants, they're making allocation decisions based on the price signals. And that, that those are all not yet fully uh, reflecting the planetary boundaries and the imperatives. If we can get that right, and I agree, Bruno, we need the government to set that framework, otherwise it won't work. Mm. And then, then we will uh, have a system that is efficient to allocate capital the right way and we are seeing that um, these pricings are coming to bear. So I, I, I'm not pessimistic, but it's taken a long time. CO2 yeah. price is is real in investment decisions today in many countries and many uh, regulatory frameworks. And uh, the consumers are doing their, their part to 
to to to make their choices uh, in yeah. terms of willingness to pay, and investors mm -hmm. um, are are joining the bandwagon in terms of allocating their capital. Yes. Yeah, Daniel, can I just can I just quickly I, I, I agree with you completely and I just build on your point about consumers and I don't know if you ever read Pavan Sukdev's book, um, you know, but he, you know, the, the master of how do you price in externalities and from a consumer perspective, there needs to be transparency on especially from advertising, right? Of actually what are the negative externalities that the products that you want to buy are having on the world. So you can make a decision as a consumer which car, which pair of jeans, which, you know, which goods you want to buy, knowing exactly what the negative effects are. And that, in then theory, will change the production line and then improve the sustainability of how those businesses, how, how those businesses make products and services. So you need absolutely investment, cl clarity on externalities, but also you've got to give complete transparency to citizens, consumers at mm -hmm. the same time. Mm -hmm. Maybe linking to that, uh, I think we have uh, time still for one quick question. Um, what do all the panelists think about the EU's proposal to restrict the marketing of plant-based dairy products? I will give the floor to somebody else because I have no answer to that question. Okay. Is that uh, promoting adequate consumer behavior or is it a little too restrictive? Well, I, I've said I, I do think there's a there, there's a role to play for governments and regulation, and I've cited examples where that's going in the in the right way, because political priorities they are translated by by politicians and legislative processes, and 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 the, the you know the the, the we see, we we see the the success that uh, parties that are integrating environmental considerations are are having, thinking about uh, the Greens Party. For instance, in in Germany, where I come from, um, so the the regulatory aspects they are important to influence consumer behavior, but they obviously translate societal trends over time. Mm. I mean, it's the same. It, I think it's the same. If 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 I'm if I'm correct, it's the same issue with you know with the burger, right? You know that there was the uh, the, the ban on yeah. being able to cause an impossible burger. I think you know. Absolutely, you should be able to say it's a dairy alternative. Uh, you know, I think that um, I, I think that there's too much um, protecting of industries that are causing such significant damage to the environment, whether it's fisheries, dairy, meat, agriculture. That uh, these alternatives are a great choice for consumers and citizens, and they should be able to market them. I think. Yeah, I would tend to agree. Well. Our session uh, is coming to a close. I think we would have gladly continued our discussion for, for a few hours more. Um, I'd like to thank the panelists for their incredible insights and having helped us to better understand you know, what's at stake in terms of food security and how private investment has a fundamental role to play in the future of food. Thank you also to the audience that connected from all over the world. Uh, we hope that the discussion has proved inspiring and that it will hopefully lead to uh, further reflection and action. And last but not least, a big thanks to De Groef Peter Kam for organizing and giving me the opportunity to moderate this panel. An important initiative, I think, to bring attention to uh, impact investing. So before the audience goes, and should you wish to view the, the webinar, uh, a replay will be uh, made available very shortly via email. We'll also provide uh, some contact details for the panelists in case you reach out, want to reach out to them directly. Thanks to everyone, and uh, have a wonderful evening.